Hello and welcome to episode 202. This is the Project Management Podcast at pm-podcast.com and I am Cornelius Fichtner. Nice to have you with us. This is the second episode with interviews that I recorded on the road in recent weeks. As a special treat, you are going to hear not just one, but four interviews today that we recorded at the PMO Symposium in Dallas, Texas. Each interview is obviously going to be about PMOs, project management offices, but with a twist. This episode of the Project Management Podcast is sponsored by the PM Exam Simulator, because nothing prepares you more for the PMP exam than being able to sit down and take a realistically simulated PMP exam. Go to freeexamsimulator.com and get your free three-day access and see for yourself what the PMP exam is like. I attended the PMO Symposium this year to help out Mark Perry. Mark is a good friend of mine. He is also the host of the PMO podcast and his company, BOT International, was an exhibitor at the PMO Symposium. He asked me to fly in and help at the BOT booth. There, I quickly realized that the other consultants from BOT International who were working at the booth with me were all exceptional experts in their fields. So, I decided to ask each of them three questions that connect their field of experience with the topic of PMOs. So, you will now hear Terry Dersher, with whom we focus on project portfolio management and the PMO, Steve Romero, whose expertise is IT governance and how it relates to PMOs, Mel Boast, who will tell you what a PMO needs to do in order to improve lessons learned in your organization, and last but not least, Mark Perry himself, with whom I discuss what business driven PMO setup and strategy really means. And now, please vote. Does the P in PMO stand for program or project? Enjoy the interview. The Project Management Podcasts feature interview. Today with the consulting team from BOT International. And we are coming to you live from the PMO Symposium 2011 here in beautiful and humid Orlando, Florida. Yes. And with me is a regular on the program, Terry Dersha. And as he said, he's now under new management. Hello, Terry. Hi, Cornelius. <laughs> it's a uh... Great, great to uh, be with you and, and actually be able to sit side by side for a change right. as well. <laughs> so you are the principal of the PPM practice at BOT International. And That's we right. wanted to take a few moments and go through three questions that I have for you in regards to PPM, Project sure. Portfolio Management. First question here for you. Quite a simple one. <laughs> Not really, no. Is PPM a critical success factor for project success? Well, I, I think if you have more than one project, absolutely. And uh, the reason I say that is, is if you step back and you think about, well, what does PPM stand for? I want to focus on the portfolio side of that. And what is portfolio management all about? It's all about making good decisions. And I would submit to you that a lot of project failures occur not as a result of a failure in the execution of the project itself, but in the fact that perhaps that project was a poor investment opportunity to begin with, should have never been started, should have not been selected, or perhaps if it was uh, selected as an investment, the right capacities weren't allocated to make it be successful. On the back side of that, then there becomes the issue of uh, assuming you produced a good deliverable, was it properly operationalized in terms of a new product or service or some other type of asset, either external to the organization or as an internal improvement? So when we think about making good decisions and how important that is to project management, then absolutely it's critical because ultimately that project is nothing more than a method of executing a tactical change 
You've got to know why you want to change to begin with. Is it the right change to make? And did I successfully uh, assimilate that change into my new normal uh, of operations? Mm -hmm. You have a workshop where you work with people to take a snapshot of their company in regards to PPM. So what do you do? How do you take that snapshot assessing a company's current PPM capabilities? Yep. yep. I actually offer uh, two different types of assessment as part of our advisory services for, for customers that are looking at embarking on a PPM initiative. The first is indeed a, a qualitative snapshot. I like to call it playing I spy uh, in terms of coming in, spin. <laughs> Spending the day, uh, yeah. Uh, where, where, where in the world is Carmen uh, PPM, right? <laughs> Just uh, doing a general overview in terms of uh, taking a look at where you are in terms of overall organizational maturity, uh, what types of tools you're using, the skill levels uh, of of not only the project managers but the project staff and sponsors, etc. Right, uh, and and then uh, kind of looking at. What are your key challenges that you're facing and what you hope to get out of going forward? And kind of use that to then give you a relative benchmark of where you are in the overall uh, continuum of uh, all of those different variables uh, and give you an idea as, uh, once again, a, a qualitative benchmark of saying, you know, you're in this quadrant or that quadrant uh, of, of uh, maturity. And as a result of that and with what you're trying to do, you know, some high level recommendations on some next steps you should take. So that's... Yeah. What kind of a scale do you use to measure? Is it just... Terry Dersha's gut feeling, or do you do you follow a methodology, or? Yeah, you know, um, there's there's a lot of assessment methodologies that are out there. Very few of them that you can execute in one day, right? Right. And really, what I want to focus on is is being able to put things in layman terms, um, talk eye to eye, and unambiguous, <laughs> you know, discussion, uh, uh, easily understood uh, uh, conversation uh, with whoever is sponsoring the assessment, and be able to say, you know, quite candidly, look. This is, this is where I see you're at. Uh, and, and what do I base that on? Gosh, I've had the opportunity to work with over 100 organizations over the years, all different shapes, sizes, verticals, et cetera, et cetera. I've, I've gotten a pretty good feel uh, in terms of uh, that level of intuition from after looking at a few key indicators of being able to put that in perspective of, of what I've been able to see in the past and, and make that relative uh, comparison. Okay. So, so that's that piece of it. Now, if you want to get a little more involved, we also have a two-day service that is goes in and does a, qua, a quantitative measurement of operational alignment. And we do that on three levels. Uh, strategic alignment in terms of uh, how well aligned are you as an organization and being able to say, here is my goals and objectives. Now, is that really the day-to-day -day working priorities people are doing, right? So that's being able to say, this is the direction the ship is heading in. Can we steer it there, right? Then there's the functional piece of it. If that's where you're trying to get the organization to go, do you have the necessary uh, competencies to be able to get there in terms of your tools, your skills, the right people on board, you know, that type of thing that really is a, an indicator of your degree of, of being able to steer effectively. And the third component, which is so often overlooked, is really cultural alignment. And that comes down to being able to understand, you know, what are the values and um, uh, all of the social mores that are happening within the organization and expectations. How are those aligned relative to the individual behaviors that are going on? And we actually do that uh, assessment using one, a... Uh, internal uh, survey that we send out to a uh, you know depending on what part of the organization we're working with the appropriate you know mix of of uh, levels and, and individuals in the organization and it's kind of an art form to ask the right questions right at each of those key intersection points and then we also do some interviews uh, with a sampling of, of key levels across the organization from senior executives to line managers project managers and staff and use all that to then create a, a, a spider graph that says this is where you're at in terms of alignment on those three planes uh, obviously all of those are 
are critical, uh, you know, in, in order to reach top levels of efficiency. In fact, that is the subject of my track presentation tomorrow morning here mm -hmm. at the uh, symposium. So. Okay. Well, that leads me right into my third and final question for you, because now that we have an assessment of our mm -hmm. organization, whether you do it or someone else right. does it, or whether we do it internally, we now know where we stand, but now we have to move into the future. So mm -hmm. how do I, as a company, set up a strategic PPM roadmap? What are a few of the steps that you would take me through in order to set this up so that I'm going down the right path? Sure. And, and as you pointed out, you know, um, every, every journey, uh, it begins with where you are today. So I think that assessment process is critical, whether uh, you do that with me or you use uh, OPM3 or many of the other different devices that are out there. And I would also suggest that you get some outside perspective on that as well, because it's very difficult to do an objective assessment uh, from the inside only. Mm -hmm. right? But once we understand what point A is, then it kind of goes back to some of the things uh, we talked about earlier. You know, the, the idea of that roadmap is we want to set a realistic and achievable both near-term as well as long-term direction that the organization uh, needs to consider heading into and then starting planning individual initiatives on how to get there. So that assessment is the key starting point. Then we have to start looking at things in terms of, you know, a lot of very organizational unique uh, attributes. What what type of industry are you in? What kind of competitive uh, pressures are you uh, under? You know, what's the timing for what you've got to do? Where are your pain points? We're basically creating prospective investments we're going to put into our improvement portfolio, right? And that portfolio analysis is going to tell us where can we get the most value, uh, you know, the greatest level of benefit at the lowest level of cost at the least amount of risk as quickly as we can, right? And, and that's what we do with the road mapping process is to help lay that out understanding that there's a lot of variables that's going to go into um, that assessment process we're going to do with these potential opportunities that we may want to invest in. So, so that gives us then our targets and our, our kind of prioritized list of how we're going to approach them. Then obviously the next component is talking about, well, what is it going to take? in terms of realistic time frames, what you should plan on in terms of being able to uh, be successful by providing enough uh, human resources and skill sets and funding in order to be able to get there. You know, sometimes it's, it's going to be very simple things. If you're talking about an enterprise PPM implementation, obviously that can get more complex, uh, you know, and, and, and we look at that accordingly, depending on, uh, you know, the individual needs of every organization. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, always a pleasure to uh, be involved with your podcast, Cornelius. And uh, hello to everyone out there. Enjoy the rest of the symposium. Next with me here at the table is Mel Boast. He is the head of the advisory group Project Closeout and Lessons Learned. So you are at the end of the projects here. And this is what we want to focus on. Hello, Mel. Hello, Cornelius. How are you? Very well. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, since we are at the end of the project, we want to talk about lessons learned. Let's focus on the project managers first that we have out there listening to us. Okay. So uh, many project managers out there, they may not have any kind of formal lessons learned process in their organization. So what can a project manager do? to ensure that he or she properly captures lessons learned on his or her project? Well, Cornelius, I, I think the most important thing that project managers can begin to think about is to reflect on their experience uh, in the project throughout the entire project itself. And uh, what I try to stress to uh, the project managers I consult with is for them to begin thinking as early as the initial stages of a project uh, what's going to happen, and then as they go through uh, identifying some significant events as they go through the project. In other words, reflection, I believe, is such an important aspect of looking back and then looking forward. Uh, reflection is the type of thing that most people don't take the time to do very well, but it's the most important thing that project managers can bring to their own project as well as to future project is to reflect 
on what they've experienced, what their project teams have experienced, and what they would like to see improved. Uh, lessons learned in the past has typically been associated with finding mistakes that people have made. I think we need to change that. Project managers need to focus more on what's the opportunity that we have to add value to not only our own project, but other things that are affected by the project outcomes. And so as they reflect on lessons learned, I think that's the most important thing is to keep in mind how the lessons learned are going to be used not only for their own organization, but for future organizations that may benefit from projects like theirs. Let's say we have a project manager is in a larger organization. They usually have PMOs. And PMOs can definitely support this process. So what should a PMO be doing in order to improve the lessons learned process across all of the portfolio of projects that they have in the organization? Well, I think, I think as more people embrace lessons learned, the PMO's major uh, uh, role can be played in helping create a culture where lessons learned are appreciated and where they are uh, sort of a, a part of the, the fabric of the organization. In other words, as, as opposed to being looked at as just an activity that's going to be included at the end of every project, they ought to be included as part of the ongoing process work or business process of project management that the organization is engaged in. I think if they begin to create that culture where people view project lessons learned as part of that ongoing business process. Uh, that's, that's a very difficult thing to do because in the past, uh, project teams, especially project managers, have wanted to get on to the next project. But what they need to do is to focus on how these lessons learned can add value not only for their own organization but for uh, future organizations that may benefit from those projects. So I think creating that culture is one of the most important things that PMOs can tackle immediately. Those people who have successfully captured some lessons learned can be mentors to other project managers, can help their leadership understand how important lessons learned are, and create that culture uh, of, of appreciation that really is is the leading edge toward creating what I call a best practice in lessons learned. A lot of organizations don't look at that as an internal best practice, but after they've done it for a while, they begin to recognize that gaining the perspectives of different people who see things differently as they progress in projects and sorting out those perspectives and understanding what the facts are and the deliverables from a project, that culture that's created there begins to appreciate and wants to foster further development of lessons learned. Right. Uh, you've already alluded a little bit to my final, third and final question that I have for you, and that's quite simple. Should lessons learned be done only at the end of the project? Well, since so many companies are not doing a very good job right now of capturing lessons learned, what I've advocated is, as a starting point, looking at the project close and gathering those lessons learned, documenting, sharing those lessons learned for future projects. But I see a trend developing out there that companies really are beginning to look at lessons learned at the end of each major stage or phase of a project. And, and I think that, that that has some advantages in that not only can the lessons be used to look back at that stage, they can be used to plan what's going to happen in the next, next stage. And so it becomes more of an iterative process as you go through the project. Each succeeding stage benefits from what's been learned by the previous stage, as opposed to waiting till the very end of a project capturing all those lessons learned and it's it's similar to to some of the analyses that I, I think your your listeners may have heard about is is if you can make a change at the end of stage one it costs you much less than if you had waited to the very end of a project and made that same change so capturing lessons learned can not only uh, improve the planning process for future stages it can eventually impact the overall cost and schedule of projects 
by adjusting uh, the deviation between actual and expected at the end of each stage. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mel. You're welcome, Cornelius. Thank you. Next, we are speaking to Steve Romero, who is the head of the IT Governance and Advisory Services of BOT International. Hello, Steve. Hello, Cornelius. Well, we are at the PMO Symposium, so I have to ask you this question. <laughs> Do you see governance as a PMO function? Um, I'd be delighted if the PMO uh, had a role in governance. Um, the, the thing that I'd be most concerned with is whether or not uh, um, that role was, was uh, appropriate or not. Um, if it's an extension of government, governance in that uh, once decision rights are assigned and accountability is assigned and, and the organization starts looking at the mechanisms that they're going to implement now to support uh, that decision making, that accountability, there are really two dimensions to it. One of them is going to be committees, roles, the assignment of that ac accountability. And then the other aspect are the processes that then support the governance and support decision making. Um, if the PMO is assigned... Uh, processes that support the decision making, then I'm delighted with that. Um, what I have found, though, in many cases is that PMO is assigned um, decision accountability when, in fact, they don't have <laughs> the authority to make those decisions and, and the PMO is assigned governance without, uh, without uh, consideration as to whether or not they are actually in a position to make some of the decisions that uh, that, that assignment of governance implies. So what then is the number one mistake that companies make when they are implementing governance? And I guess it, it goes a, a, it, uh, kind of an extension of some of the comments that I already made. It, it's that it's not understood as to what governance is. Um, far too many organizations look at governance as just a thing to check off the list of, of things to do. Um, and generally, when organizations address governance, they, they don't understand it in its complete nature. So they either think of it as risk management, compliance, regulatory requirements, legal requirements. Um, and then nowadays, uh, a lot of organizations mistakenly equate governance with investment decision making and product and portfolio management. Um, those are absolutely two critical aspects of governance, but there is much more to governance than just investment decision making and, and risk management. So for most organizations, I guess the number one mistake is a lack of understanding of the true nature of governance and all the things that, that, uh, that, that are involved with governance. So in addition to investment decision making and risk management, it includes strategic planning, project management, operations, strategic sourcing. Um, uh, security. There are a number of other components associated with governance, and unfortunately, most organizations don't address all of those things. They almost always address a subset of governance. Okay, so let's do it the right way then. I have an organization, I have a company, we need governance. Steve, we're bringing you in to help us. What are the first three things that you are going to do for us to ensure that we're heading down the right path here. Right. So one of the first things I'm going to do is find out what the what the uh, the view of governance is in the organization. Okay. Um, so try to query query as many people as possible to see first what their view of governance is to determine whether or not there's a consistent view in the organization. And very rarely do I find that to be the case. Um, and, and I guess I would start with the executive leadership team. In fact, uh, one of the really good indicators of, of sound governance, at least according to some research out of uh, MIT's Center for Information Systems Research out of the uh, Sloan School of Management, um, one of the things that they have found is if you can find an executive leadership team that has a common view of governance, then that's a really good sign that governance is working well in that organization. So I, I would look to see, again, how it's being interpreted in the organization, how disparate the view might be amongst the leadership team and then just get a general impression as to where they're applying the term who's using the term and where it's being used and uh, along uh, some of the comments I already made I, I could just about be certain that I'll find it in the audit circles and the risk circles and the security um, uh, functions within the organization I'll probably find it used when it comes to investment decision making and portfolio planning etc but I probably won't find it used in some other places where governance has a, a, a huge role in the organization. So the architecture team, do they look at themselves as a governance function? And architecture is one of the longest standing governance functions. So the strategic planning organization or the function of strategic planning organization, do they look at themselves as governance? And then go on down the list of some of the things that I already named, project management, strategic sourcing, 
even operations and systems development, those are all extensions of governance. And I guess the, I'd, I'd want to know whether or not those, are, those, those aspects of the organization, those functions, those processes, in fact, that's how I'd really like to look at it, more processes and functions. Do they recognize their role in governance? And then uh, once I have a, an understanding of, of how governance is perceived in the organization, then do what just about everyone should do whenever you're implementing a new process or a new service in the organization is figure out where where the the enterprise is suffering the most pain, where their problems are, and then establish the, uh, the vestiges of governance in those subsets of the organization to address some of those pain points, as opposed to coming up with like a one size fits all, you know, boil the ocean approach to governance, which is another common mistake for many organizations. All right, Steve, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. It was a pleasure. Last but not least, I have Mark Perry, Head of PMO Setup Services here at the table with me. Hello, Mark. Hi, Cornelius. We've had you on before, haven't we? We have. It's a pleasure to be back. <laughs> Lovely. So we are still at the PMO Symposium, and we are finally talking to somebody who has the words PMO in his title. So you talk a lot about business-driven PMO setup and strategy. In fact, you've written a book business-driven project portfolio management, business-driven PMO set up two books. In fact, what do you mean by business-driven? Cornelius, that is a great question. What I mean by business-driven is a PMO that is fundamentally, by design, set up to achieve and focus on a business-driven problem. What's the problem to be solved or what are the issues to be addressed? And having that be the predicate for which a PMO of some kind can be of value to the organization. So in other words, instead of me as the PMO director sitting in my office and figuring out what the PMO should look like, I have to go out and actually talk to people in the business and figure out what they want? That's exactly right. And let me give you an example of that. My very first PMO that I was involved with was in 1982 at IBM. At that time, I was a newly hired IBMer, and IBM was going through a transformation of a primarily rental mainframe computer company to a company that was going to now actually sell computers to customers. Up until that point in time, if you wanted to IBM a mainframe, you would have to place an order two years in advance, and when it came, you would have it on rent month to month to month. So IBM had a number of transformational things that it was seeking to do in the year of 1981, 1982, and I happened to be in a PMO that was about eight levels down organizationally from the CEO. It was completely invisible to the upper executives, but it was a quite important PMO uh, for a particular Dallas IBM organization called the Dallas Branch Office of the Manufacturing Industry. And the branch manager and leadership team, as they had their business objectives for the year, felt that there were so many transformational change issues they faced in this transformation from a rental business to a purchase business. Because no longer would you be quoting mainframes on rent, you'd be quoting purchase and total cost of ownership. Uh, we'd be quoting leasing uh, alternatives. We'd be educating customers on the five-year total cost of computing, residual value analysis, Gartner Group estimates. You can just imagine a wide variety of changes that this particular field branch office, one of 250, uh, was going through and they decided to form a PMO. Now the business purpose of that PMO was not to staff an organization, it was not to develop a methodology, and it was not to train people on project management. So people, process, and tools was not the purpose. Rather, the branch office had a revenue objective of 250 million, uh, and that was the core objective of this PMO, was to facilitate with the leadership team the activities required to both successfully transform from one business model to the next and achieve some revenue along the way. And over the course of the particular year of this temporary program office, temporary PMO, about 75 projects were conducted. Now, were they perfectly conducted? No. But were they aligned to the key needs for which the PMOs are created? Absolutely. And at the end of the year, the branch office actually overachieved 8% of a revenue number. And on a large base, that was a pretty big number. But the point was, the PMO wasn't driven by someone's idea of a PMO model, wasn't driven by someone's idea of a people process tool strategy, wasn't driven by someone's idea of project management maturity and project management skills. The PMO was driven by the business need 
that this particular organization had. So that's a long answer, but but that's what I meant by a business-driven PMO as opposed to a theory-driven PMO or a PMO that may be driven by uh, examples of cookie-cutter models that may or may not be appropriate for the organization. So where do you start when someone calls you in and says, Mark, please help us set up our PMO? What are the first few things you do? That is a great question and the best question to start the discussion with. Uh, by way of background, you know, for the last decade, I've been frustrated professionally because that's the question I'd like to start. <laughs> and many times I'd be in a PMO that would say, well, we staffed the organization, we implemented methodology, doing some training, and now we're trying to determine what our strategy ought to be. <laughs> but the reality <laughs> is that the best place to start is answering the simple question, what problem are we trying to solve? And based upon the problem we have, does a PMO of some kind, vis-a-vis -vis what some people refer to as models, does a PMO of some kind advance in that area? And I'm very excited in that just last year, the United Kingdom Office of Government Commerce of Her Majesty's Treasury came out with a best practice guidance called P3O, Project Program Portfolio Office. And in this guidance, it's a, a set of guidance for how to set up a program office of some type. And the first question that they ask isn't what process are you going to staff, uh, what process are you going to develop, what organization are you going to staff, but the very first question in the official guidance from the OGC is what problem does the business have for which a PMO of some kind can participate in solving. So that's the very first place I would start. What problem are we seeking to solve? And finally, how can our listeners identify if their organization needs a PMO or not? You know, that's a great question. There are those that advocate every organization should have a PMO. I'm not sure I'd go that far. But, but I do advocate the concept of what type of issues do organizations have that the application of project management can help with. Some organizations are very operational, and they don't do a lot of projects. Other organizations may be operational, but they may do a lot of transformational projects to improve operations. But at the end of the day, I think the question becomes, what type of problems does the organization have that the day-to-day -day operational management has difficulty addressing? For those organizations, the next question becomes, would a organization, whether we call it PMO or another acronym, would a PMO of some kind help address those issues that the leadership team or the collective department heads just can't seem to address vis-a-vis -vis business as usual. So if the answer is all the problems we have can be addressed with just functional management, then you don't need a program office. But if you find that there are some problems that the organizational, that the organization institutionally has that just aren't going away, uh, and there's a need for cross-functional participation, collaboration, understanding how we want to link up key strategy of the organization to key uh, investments to key projects, uh, sometimes those discussions don't lend themselves particularly well to functional management only. And when that's the case, a project office of some kind that is focused on solving a business problem of some kind can be tremendously valuable. Perfect. Thank you very much for your time, Mark. Well, thank you for those questions. I hope next time you'll ask easier questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. And I hope next time perhaps you'll give the uh, advance notice of what you're asking, because when you do, you always ask different questions that you tell me you're going to ask, but it's a pleasure <laughs> to be on the show. And in all fairness, I should mention to our listeners that uh, just a few moments ago, you treated the PMO Symposium crowd here in Orlando, Florida, to an amazing display of juggling. Uh. So amongst your many talents, <laughs> I did not know that juggling was one of them. Yes, I, I keep that to myself. Okay, well, then we, we can cut this out of the episode and only you, it's, it's our secret. Okay, okay. Thank you. Bye, Bye, Mark. And that was my interview with Terry Dersha, Steve Romero, Mel Boast, and Mark Perry with their respective consulting experience and how it relates back to the project management offices. That's it for today. Thank you very much for listening. As always, you can find us on the web at pm-podcast.com. If you are a project manager who wants to become a PMP, then the easiest way to do so is with our sister podcast, the Project Management Prepcast, and study for the exam by watching over 38 hours of video training from pmprepcast.com. 
please send your emails to info at pm-podcast.com. And when you write, please tell me where in the world you are writing from. And finally, we have this. You will remember that you forgot to prepare that all-important project status meeting at the moment when your calendar reminder pops up on your screen, which is about 15 minutes before the meeting starts. Until next time.